Hey everyone, and welcome to this episode of How We Do House Church. My name is Dr. Jason Barker, and it's my privilege to serve as the academic dean at Reformation Seminary, where we have one mission, and Dale, that mission is to train men to plant biblical house churches all around the world. Amen. How are you doing today? I'm excited because we're going to have a discussion about the practicality of a house church in the sense of what happens, what's the minute by minute outline format for a house church gathering. I think this is probably one of the main questions that people ask me. So I'm excited. Yeah. So let's just dive into it. How does a house church worship gathering work? What are some of the distinctives philosophically or practically when a house church gathers on Sunday mornings? Yeah. I mean, one thing we have to keep in mind is house church, well, church is for believers. That's right. Now, it is not restricted to the lost, but it's also not the place that you invite people to evangelize to. We're called to go out uh, and to make disciples. We're, we're called to evangelize to the lost. And when someone is converted, we would bring them to the church where they could be baptized, where they could uh, become a member of the church. But a lost person can't even say amen at the end of a prayer because they don't agree. Uh, now, they can't do communion. They can't be a part of that. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't invite somebody that might be evident that the Lord is drawing them. There's a, a genuine, honest seeking that you're seeing the Lord is put upon their heart. So we'd invite those individuals. Uh, but it's not the same as like the megachurch world where it's like, invite your friends. And if they come on Sunday, we'll give them a $5 gift card to Starbucks. You know, like we're not doing that where we're basically outsourcing our responsibility of evangelism to the paid pastor so that he could do it for us, where inviting people to church has replaced evangelism. And uh, we have to just keep in mind that the, the purpose of the church is the edification of the saints for the work of ministry. And so um, it's not evangelism. Evangelism is outward mission of the church, but the church gathering itself is for the edification of the saints. So again, there's a balance there. And it's not that if someone shows up in my house that was lost, that I would say, you can't be here. No, I'd absolutely say, come on in. But it's, it's not a invite your friends uh, kind of thing that uh, don't know Jesus. Um, or have rejected Jesus, but just want to come, you know, so there's just some discernment required there. You know, I, I think you're right on because in, in many traditional churches, worship has become about attracting the unsaved. Yes. And I'm probably going to butcher this quote. I don't know who said it. I know I've heard you say it many times before, but what you win a person with is ultimately what you win them to. Yes. And so if a church is, and, and it's not that that activities and things like that are in and of themselves wrong, but if you've taken your Sunday morning worship service and you've wandered down your gospel message to make it less offensive, if you have picked songs that are uh, less doctrinally challenging or something because they might be troublesome or misunderstood, then you are robbing the believer of a rich worship experience while providing something that the unsaved person actually can't do anything with. Yeah. You're, you're essentially feeding the goats and starving the sheep. Sure. I mean, that is what so many churches have done in the church growth movement. Um, this pragmatism that's there. So that's step one. Step two is discussing the outline of a house church gathering. Right. One, let me just say this. Uh, if you're going to gather with a house church in the Reformation Fellowship Network, expect to be there for five hours. So just that's kind of typical Sunday. We start at uh, 10 o'clock for our gathering. And at 10 a.m., we have this wonderful experience of fellowship with each other. We, we start uh, getting together as families. We have some snacks and maybe some cinnamon rolls or whatever that might be. And at 1030, uh, we would call the meeting to order. And again, this is a meeting. It's not a service. It's uh, a gathering. It's not a production. And we sit together uh, down in a, again, more of a circular structure. 
than less of a monologue structure where everybody's pointed in one direction. We try to want to be facing one another so we can discuss with one another. And then we have an order of worship, what we call the free worship liturgy. It's this idea where there's some freedom because we're small to basically have some spirit prompted free discussion. And I, I, you know, I'm not a charismatic, right? So when I say spirit prompted, I mean, I'm meaning just that the, the Lord's laying something on your heart and you, there's an opportunity to say that within the right structure and discerning times and gender roles and all those things that are there. But if you want to sing an extra hymn, we can do that. Um, if you want to bring a prayer request in at any given point, you, you can basically do that. If you have a question during the sermon and you're a man, uh, asking that question because scripture says in first Corinthians 14, if a woman has a question on these things to go home and ask her husband, but if a man has a question, he can do that. And so there's some free worship there, but there's also a liturgical structure. So we, we actually have these things printed out. So you would actually have a copy, um, along with your hymnal. And the first thing we do is I, I assign these roles as the elder of the church or, uh, one of the elders of the church would do this you would assign roles to the men to fulfill in this liturgy, which is great because men can't check out. They can, uh, they are engaged and involved by design where in a traditional model, you have one or two guys involved on the stage and 200 men doing nothing. And so here you get an opportunity to activate these men to be engaged in the spiritual edification of the body. And so I assign one guy to open up in prayer and that individual open us up in prayer. And then I assign another individual to lead us in song. And so uh, we'll go through typically three hymns out of the hymnal. We do the hymns of grace uh, from the master seminary. In my opinion, it's probably the best hymnal that's out there. And uh, we sing three songs. And again, there's an opportunity for uh, you know, one of the ladies might say, can we sing Rock of Ages? And we, oh yeah, let's do that. Um, and then after that is we pray for the local city that we're in, the uh, persecuted church um, and the uh, the government. Uh, this is again, right in scripture. We're called to do this. And I assign another gentleman to, to pray for that. Uh, then we have a time of prayer requests and praise reports. And this is the best time. It's the thing that the traditional church is absolutely missing is that we get to hear back and forth the prayer requests and praise reports from the men and women. Now, the men do the praying uh, as according to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, but the men and women can offer these prayer requests and reports of prayers answered. And you're just shocked how every week there's something going on in someone's life that just knits you together closer. And that time can sometimes take five minutes. Sometimes it takes 30. Then we do a Bible reading. So I'll assign a chapter of scripture to be read aloud by somebody, by one of the men. And this again is a wonderful inauguration of a conversation about something that's there because it leads us into what I call an open teaching time where the men get an opportunity to teach for basically a reactive teaching moment of, you know, what it said there in Ephesians 1 about um, being predestined before the foundation of the world. This has been so comforting to me. And there's a little bit of a moment for these men to exercise this gifting of teaching under the supervision of elders uh, for the edification of the body. And that sometimes lasts for, again, five to 10 minutes. Then we go into an expository sermon. So I'll prepare a full 30-minute, 40-minute expository sermon, verse by verse. Uh, after that, we do uh, a time of communion and repentance. So what we do is we give everybody a time, about one minute of self-examination before we do communion together. And this allows the, the believer to make sure they're right with the Lord. There's no shadows between them and the Lord. There's no shadows between them and another believer and examine themselves as 1 Corinthians 11 tells. And so that we can uh, do communion together. And we do uh, the bread and the cup. And then after that, we we uh, have announcements 
And sometimes the men or the women, we have men's meetings and women's meetings and people are going to be gone and birthdays or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then we close where we assign somebody to do prayer. We close out the meeting prayer. Then we potluck for two and a half, three hours of time where all of the things that were said in the meeting, all the discussion, the sermon discussion can happen there where we're in different conversations, group conversations, private conversations, men and women conversations. Um, and all of this is fully family integrated, which I know is what we're going to be talking about next. But this is kind of that big vision, families together, worshiping God. And it's just a wonderful and edifying time. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought this up about families because I know that that's one of the more frequent questions that we get from people. Uh, and, and probably one of the things that scares people most about doing a house church is we, we've really been trained that the appropriate thing on Sundays is to adults go to worship and kids go to Sunday school or, or what, or, you know, whatever small group or kids ministry or youth ministry. And this is a, a different approach to that. Now it brings with it some unique problems and mm-hmm. challenges is probably the better way opportunities. What do kids do? How do we integrate them into that worship time? And how, how does that work on a Sunday without being just a, a, a big distraction or, or, or too big of a challenge? Yeah. So we, we, we often, one, uh, being so close with one another, you'll quickly learn which parents are good at child training and which ones aren't. And lovingly, the ones that are good, that have no plank in their eye, can walk up to those other families that might need help in child training to teach their children to sit still. or And the toddler zone is always the hardest, right? right you have sure. babies that are going to cry no matter what. Um, you can't stop a baby from crying. And then you have toddlers who are really in the training zone. Um, now, if you have seven-year-olds and eight-year-olds that are just throwing a fit, it's an evident problem. And so the, the great beauty of being close with one another is that those things become evident and they can be corrected. Our flesh hates that. We don't want to be corrected. We don't want to right. be sure. pointed out that my kids are actually not well-behaved. But it's really wonderful, actually. It's a beautiful, sanctifying process. But as a pastor, not only am I preaching to the children regularly, I mean, I'm engaging the kids, we're making sure they're singing. The kids that are maybe seven, eight, nine, that zone, we want them to have Bibles open, notes available if possible. Uh, We want to teach them what it means to worship and what it means to be serious about listening to to the Word of God being preached. But we also ask questions, rhetorical questions, direct questions to the children, um, even in the middle of the sermon. And then after, we've had ideas and discussions, and in the past we've done this, is what we'll have uh, maybe a time right after the sermon, five minutes of uh, catechism time for the kids, or, or 10 minutes of scripture memorization for the kids, um, where one of the adults will take the kids aside and we'll go, hey, we're going to memorize this passage of scripture, or hey, we're going to do our first five questions for that catechism. And... So there's some integration of creative ideas that gives you that freedom to do that. But the big thing is that they are integrated. They are not segregated from the adults. And they really are a part of the body. And they feel it. They know it. And, uh, and the, the relationship between children and their parents, especially their fathers as the shepherd of the home, is reinforced. Um, and it's just a... When you do it, it's kind of like the difference between going from public school to homeschool or from, from like conventional farming to like, you know, homesteading. Yeah. Like it's this like, it's so rich that you're just like, I can't do it any other way now. Yeah. You know, Dale, I remember being a little kid going to church and um, it was always a good Sunday when my parents didn't have me go to children's church or Sunday school, but they brought me to big church. Yes. And I would see my dad pray. He was a deacon. He would sometimes get called on to pray. It was a great opportunity to see my parents and, and, and my dad in particular in a, in a wholly different light than maybe what I would sometimes see him in. Uh, he worked a lot. So it was a great opportunity to just see him step up into leadership. And so I think that what we're talking about here with family integrated worship it's so supportive of a strong family structure. Kids get to learn how to, uh, you know, behave and learn how to worship and to participate. They, they don't grow up thinking that church is a place that they come to to be served. 
but they see that service up front. Parents are are challenged and equipped, uh, and and are it's 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 just modeled on Sundays that this this is our life together. And you know, as I understand it, God created two institutions to help with raising kids. One of them is the family, and it's the primary one. The second one is the church. Yes, it's the secondary one. It's there to help parents raise their children. And so what better way than integrated family worship? Amen. And again, I just say when you do church and everything we've done and we talked about today is rooted specifically in scripture. Our free worship liturgy is backed by scripture verse by verse. And again, just the closeness, it really does create an experience that you feel like you're living in New Testament Christianity. And it produces an environment and connected relationships that everybody is longing for. And it solves so many of the problems that the traditional church is faced with right now. And so, um, again, it's just a great, wonderful thing to be a part of these communities. Um, so come plant a church, guys. If Men, if you're out there, we want you to come be trained at Reformation right. Seminary because we need more men to step up to plant these communities there are so many people that inquire to us about a house church on a That's regular right. basis. Yep. And we have to tell them, no, sorry, we don't have one there. We don't have one there. We don't have one there because we need men to step up. Yeah. So that's a shameless plug for uh, Reformation Seminary. <laughs> so if you have questions about being trained men as a, a biblical house church pastor, biblical house church planter, head to reformationseminary.com, fill out an enrollment inquiry, and uh, we'll get you connected with Dale to answer all of your questions. Now, I know it's also possible that you tuned into the podcast, this podcast, specifically because of the title. You had questions about how do how do families integrate into the worship gathering for answers, more detailed answers, I guess, uh, yeah. to those and more questions. You can always check out Dale's book, how we do house church. This is actually one of our textbooks at the seminary. It essentially sums up all of the doctrines and convictions that are specific to reformation fellowship network churches. And anything you'd add about this book, Dale? It's just a short book. You could read it in an hour and a half and everybody that reads it writes me and says, how do we do this? Where do we find one of these churches? And so uh, yeah, it's a great read. You could buy that at relearn.org, um, at our store there. You could also buy it on Amazon. Yeah. You know, house church is a different concept and simply because it's different, it can sometimes be frightening, but I know your experience is the same as mine is that when we talk to people about what a biblical house church really is, when we talk to believers about that. That's what they're really looking for. Amen. And it's not always, unfortunately, what they're finding. Um, and again, that's not a knock on traditional churches. There's just some things that that house churches are, are really effective at doing. So Amen. anyway, thanks again for tuning in to this episode of How We Do House Church. Just as a reminder, these episodes are available uh, in both podcast uh, and video format across all platforms. Thanks again for tuning in, and we will see you guys next time. Amen.